So welcome to Straight Science, everyone. Straight Science is an evening science presentation series put on by UAF Northwest Campus in Nome, and also UAF, the University of Alaska Fairbanks, uh, Alaska Sea Grant Marine Advisory Program, and you're in the home office. And both UAF Northwest Campus and Alaska Sea Grant, we are public servants for the Bering Strait region. And the Bering Strait region is the homeland and waters of the Inupiaq, Yupik, and St. Lawrence Island Yupik peoples. And tonight, Tundra be damned, we've got uh, Ken Tate. With, he is a research associate professor with the University of Alaska Fairbanks Geophysical Institute. And we're very intrigued. His poster, he's got a Hawaiian shirt with a mandolin and he's Tundra be damned, he's gonna tell us all about how beavers are re-engineering the tundra as they are on a trek westward ho on the Seward Peninsula and probably Northern, but we'll learn more about it when he gets a chance to talk, which uh, he will do. First, I wanna say, if we do get a caller and we have been having the last couple of straight sciences, some callers coming in a little bit late, uh, all, um, it's very hard to be a caller on a Zoom call. So if we get a caller, know that I will give priority for questions and things like that, but we want you to participate as well. And, um, but if you see me paying attention to callers, that's why it's very hard to, with the video and whatnot. With that, Ken Tape, we're awful glad to have you. And we are intrigued to hear more about Tundra Be Dam, Beavers of the Arctic. Take it away. Thank you so much. Thank you, Gay. Thanks for uh, hosting this talk series. Uh, it's an awesome opportunity to uh, reach out to, to people who are living on the Seward Peninsula in the Nome area, um, but also more widely. I see, recognize a few familiar faces. We're not from the Nome area, so thanks for joining in uh, this evening. All right, to those of you in Nome, I'm glad you all survived the storm. Uh, I understand that there's some rebuilding to be done, uh, not just in Nome, but in these outlying communities. and. I'm glad to hear that that is underway and uh, hopefully most of you are sort of getting back to uh, life as usual after that storm. I know that was a really, really big one. Um, yeah, this, my name's Ken Tate. I see something in the chat here. I'm just gonna check it real quick. No, I'm not gonna check it. My name's Ken Tate, I'm from UAF. These are my two colleagues who work on this. Uh, you know, it's, it's all a bunch of teamwork. This is Jason Clark at the University of Alaska Fairbanks and Ben Jones also at UAF. Um, most of this work is funded by the National Science Foundation. Okay. There we go. So this was the fold out sort of the center fold in National Geographic. They had an, uh, an issue a few years ago now, 2019 about how the Arctic landscape is changing. They'd had stuff on the sea ice in the past, but this was more about how the landscape was changing. And this was sort of like the, the fold out in the center. And I'm just going to go around and, and point out a few of these things that are uh, that climate change is, is imposing on the Arctic landscape. Uh, you can see tundra fires here over on the left. You can see a thaw slump, one of these permafrost features. Uh, you can see a thaw slump here. You can see uh, receding glacier back here. There's another one right here, incidentally. That's uh, that's up in the in the eastern Brooks Range. Um, but yeah, receding glaciers. Uh, you can see thawing ice wedge permafrost, thawing polygonal ground here. You can see shrub expansion. So Arctic is a lot shrubbier than it used to be 50 years ago or 100 years ago, and that's something that. I'm sure if you've been in Nome for half a century that you've observed, or maybe even maybe even a few decades, you've observed uh, the expansion of shrubby vegetation. And then moose are new to the Arctic in the last century, uh, to, to Western Alaska, Northwestern Alaska, Northern Alaska. And then I was really pretty excited because our, our research was in its sort of in its infancy at this stage, but beavers made it into the into the pictures here. So beavers have also moved into the Arctic, partly maybe rebounding from being overtrapped, but also because there's more shrubs, there's more unfrozen water, it's basically a more hospitable place and there's more habitat than there used to be. So I'm gonna talk 
mostly today not about these other changes going along, going on, thaw slumps, uh, permafrost thaw, shrub expansion, and such, but uh, show you some pictures about beavers uh, in the Arctic and talk a little bit about that. This is uh, the local cartoonist in Fairbanks, Jamie Smith. He drew this, this cartoon in 2001. Little did he know that it's like a perfect, it was a perfect prophecy for what has unfolded in the tundra regions of Alaska in the last two decades. And indeed this, this picture has been taking place all over the tundra of Alaska. Uh, you know, this could easily be uh, what the lower no attack, right? You've got the Brooks Range in the background and you've got this landscape that really doesn't have, has a lot of free flowing water, and doesn't have beaver engineering and they have been moving into this landscape over the last, uh, depending on where you are, the last one year to, the, to 50 years, right? It just depends on where you are, whether or not they've sort of got to your, your area yet. So I'll go through a gallery of maybe a half dozen pictures of beaver ponds to give you an idea what they look like in the tundra. Sometimes I give this talk in places that are a long ways for the tundra, from the tundra. And so I spend some time talking about the various attributes of the tundra, but I think most people here are pretty familiar with it. So I'm just gonna show you some pictures and give you an idea of what these ponds look like. This is a stream up the Kugruk Road, about 47 miles, and then you go a mile off the road. This is looking down on a beaver pond. It's flowing right to left. It's taken uh, by my colleague, Jason Clark. You can see, the, you can see the, the dam there. In this picture, it's about 85 meters long, that, that longest dam. We went back, this is from a couple years ago. We went back last year and it's, I don't know, it's at least 50% longer than it is here. And it's just turning into an even bigger wetland. And it's not like it's an isolated thing, you know, there's ponds, there's more dams and more ponds upstream and downstream. So the beaver's really taken what was a pretty small tundra stream and turn it into this series of, of, of wetlands. This is actually standing down on that dam. Uh, you can see a beaver lodge there. There's maybe, I'm, I'm walking right along the top of the dam here, which is like super treacherous. And one thing about we're learning about beaver science is that, you know, the landscape around these ponds is intentionally made difficult to traverse. Like, yeah, you can boat the pond, but actually most of it is like not boatable, but also not walkable unless you have chest waders. And it's made that way because the beaver is, it needs to protect itself from predators, right? So this un underwater is where the beaver wants to be. The beaver does not want to be up on shore chewing on shrubs. And so they build this dam, they, they flood a big area, and then they can flee into that water anytime they need and, and readily escape predators. And that goes for the winter too. They get frozen into their lodge. So here's another view of a beaver pond. This is also at Kugruk Road. I think it's called, what's this river called? The Grand, Grand Central River maybe? It's in that area. And you can see just a large area adjacent to this river that's been flooded by this beaver pond. That's the same pond. That's, I think, the Grand Central going into uh, Salmon Lake. Here's one from the Denali Highway, which you might say is technically not the Arctic, but you can also see that there aren't any trees here. So this is, uh, you know, between the Parks Highway and this is in the Alaska Range, right? Denali Highway, not in the National Park, but between the Parks Highway and the Richardson Highway. And this is probably, an old. this pond looks like it's been here for quite a while. There's quite a bit of uh, elevation there between you know, the, the perched pond and the water down below it. And then, so you've, I've showed you some pictures of individual ponds. As you start to zoom out a little bit, this is how beavers are affecting the landscape on a little bit larger scale. So beaver engineering, it's like a new disturbance regime, right? It's not just like moose moving in the Arctic, I find interesting as a, as a possible response to climate change. And yeah, you know, they modify shrubs and things like that. But what beavers do to the landscape is just next level compared to other animals. And one indication is that, of that is that 
Beavers are one of the few animals where you can see the footprint they leave on the earth, that you can see that footprint from space. And that's really what got our attention and, and got us really interested in this problem. We study uh, landscape change in the Arctic. And usually that's kind of a gradual process, whether it's permafrost thaw or um, you know, shrub expansion. But when beavers get into these areas, it's like you started with a little stream and all of a sudden you have this just completely different. And so if you look at this photo, here's a beaver pond here on the left. Here's another beaver pond here. This is a beaver pond here. You can see the beaver has dammed this river. Some of these dams are broken. Uh, you can see dams all through here. And I'll tell you what I did. This is one of the first experiences I had with beaver ponds. I took a pack raft and I came in here on the left side of the picture and I boated across this pond and I sort of half boated, half bushwhacked over to this pond, went across this pond, came down here, and then just got lost on this maze of, of dams and channels back here. I mean, it's just a labyrinth, uh, more lodges, bushwhacked out to this river, floated down the river. The rivers just beaver chew everywhere, lodges, dams. Um, anyway, and, and incidentally, this lodge right here looked like a missile had hit the side of it and just exploded out the side of it. I'm pretty sure a bear dug its way uh, into, into this lodge. Uh, looking for a looking for a meal, I, I just don't know what else would have done it, and it would just look bare because it was just like an explosion, you know. Anyway, so when we start to talk about each beaver pond being added to the landscape, this is something that you can sort of keep in your mind. They're really altering the landscape dramatically and storing all this water that otherwise would just be this little single channel river flowing all the way down. So. I talked about the fact that you can see this in satellite imagery. You know, with wildlife, one of the most difficult things to ascertain are basic questions like, how many of them are there and where are they? You know, those are actually like basic questions that are super difficult and pretty expensive to answer if you wanna know how many moose are out there and where do they exist or how many hares are out there and where, where they exist. Um, these are difficult questions to answer. So what's exciting about beavers is they leave a mark that we can see. And so you go back to 1980, this is a, a color infrared film. So what's red here is actually green tundra. And you've got what we think of as our traditional Arctic stream, you know, maybe about as wide as my office. Uh, and that's the flow direction from right to the left. And then by 2019, I mean, it's just unrecognizable. And you can see the scale here. I mean, these dams are routinely 100 meters or more long. So these are, these are good, you know, this, these ponds are a football field wide. It's a huge pond and it's, it's all the way down the river. So this was super exciting for us. We could track their movement into tundra using time series of satellite imagery. And let me back up since I'm talking to folks in Nome, this one is, these are both on the Seward Peninsula. This one's, I would say, east of Council, I don't know, maybe 30 or 40 miles in that general area. Uh, this one, I believe, I think, the, I think this one is uh, west of Nome, you know, between Nome and, and Teller, not even, not that far from Nome, I think. Uh, I'm guessing these are some of those drainage um, or ditches that I see that maybe were used for mining. I'm speculating, but I, I'm guessing that's what those are. Uh, but you can see in 2003, you have this little stream again, kind of like as wide as my office, little traditional tundra stream, and it's just unrecognizable in 2016. So this is super exciting for us that we could track the movement of beavers into the tundra. And of course, we're also really interested in what the impacts are to these ecosystems. And what we have along those lines are more hypotheses than answers, but I'll talk a little bit about that. So um, my colleagues and I spent, uh, Jason Clark and Ben Jones spent quite a bit of time mapping beaver ponds in the Arctic. So this figure here, all the gray area is, is within the forest, right? So all the gray area is forest, so let's just forget about that. And everything that's colored um, in Northwest Alaska here, 
is the tundra. And uh, what you have here is, this is called a heat map. This is called just a density map of beaver ponds in, in, the, in Arctic Alaska. So we mapped, and when I say we've mapped, we flew using satellite imagery, every stream and stream branch and river and lake in the Alaska Arctic, with the exception of a few areas, about 10% of the areas we didn't have imagery, and we just mapped all the beaver ponds. Anything that was you know, clearly identifiable as a beaver pond, we mapped. And so we mapped something like 12,000 beaver ponds. And what you see here is a map of where you have and don't have beaver ponds. Blue means no beaver ponds. So beavers are right at the continental divide of the Brooks Range right now. And this entire area of the North Slope is, awaits them. In fact, they are in the Conga Cut River over here. They're in the Canning River, the headwaters of the Canning River. They're in the headwaters of some of the Colville tributaries. So they have to swim downstream and they have to find suitable habitat, which they may or may not find. I, I don't know. But what you can see is Nome is a, is a pretty hot spot. There's a lot of beaver activity around Nome. Now, Selawick, sort of the Selawick lowlands here, they, they win the prize for, for the highest density, but they're also pretty close to tree line there. So Nome is a pretty, is a hot spot. And, um, and you can see like the northern part of the Seward Peninsula is actually looks a little bit more like the North Slope. It's colder, more ice-rich permafrost. You do have beavers in some of the, beavers got a foothold in the serpentine tributaries because they're springs, right? Beavers go for springs for, for, for obvious reasons, I think. They're open in the winter, right? And they're probably higher dissolved oxygen, who knows, but they, they go for springs. So anyway, this is what beaver, the, the footprint of beaver disturbance in Arctic Alaska looks like. This is a little bit of a complicated figure. So let me just give you, give you the, the main message and, and we can, you can ask me about it later if you want or try to interpret it yourself. With the exception of this area in tree line over here where B is, with the exception of that area near tree line, we took imagery from 2000 and 2020, let's just say 2003 and 2017, and we looked at how it had changed just where you have the gray areas, because that's where we had imagery for both of those high resolution satellite imagery for both of those epics. And what you see is that basically, with the exception of this area near tree line, there's a doubling or more of beaver ponds as they move west, or west into new regions of the Seward Peninsula and, and Northwest Alaska. So, you know, the no attack up here went from 153 ponds to 364. Kobuk Selawik, this is this area B, it was about the same. Basically that area was filled up with beavers by 2003 and it's still filled up with beavers now, almost the exact same number. Kotzebue has gone absolutely bonkers in the last 20 years and I'll, I'll show some figures from that. And then nor Northern Sewer Peninsula, you can see about a doubling and, and then Norton Sound, which is this whole area around Nome is also approximately a doubling. So a lot of, change and it's it's underway we've, we've caught them in the act which is super exciting so to, to zoom into one of those areas my colleague ben jones wrote this paper a couple years ago now looking at the area around kotzebue where he had particularly good imagery so he mapped dams instead of ponds that's a small distinction but uh in 2002 around kotzebue he mapped two dams by 2008 seven dams, 2012, 34 dams, 2019, 98 dams. So when you talk about a doubling, it, it sort of blurs the fact that they're just moving into new areas and colonizing new areas, as well as increasing their numbers in existing areas. If you look at a little bit bigger area here, the Northern Baldwin Peninsula, this is, these, these dates are constrained by where we have imagery available, but 2010, you can see 94 dams, 2019, 409 dams. I mean, they're everywhere. We, we were out there picking sites uh, by helicopter in, uh, in August, and we, we often need to find a control segment of stream, what we call the control, right? The area that's unaffected by beavers. That's the problem is that it's super hard to find an area that's unaffected by beavers because they're everywhere. So really interesting. And that's 
you know, this is entirely consistent with uh, the local observations from this area of, of beavers moving in over the last couple of decades. So I'll show you a little bit of the impacts to permafrost. I'll give you an example here. We're, we're physical scientists, you know, we, that's sort of our backgrounds more in like permafrost and snow and ice and hydrology, a little bit in vegetation. Um, but we also think that the physical impacts are a little bit easier to predict initially. And so our idea is we're getting a good idea of how beavers affect hydrology, and permafrost, and then, and as well as snow and ice, and then to sort of go out from there and answer bigger questions about uh, biodiversity, fish, um, and even things like boat access and, and things like that. So, so here's an example of how beavers affect permafrost. This is from a paper that Ben wrote. This is a, a little tiny stream that exits Swan Lake. It's about, is it about 62 miles, 64 miles out the uh, Kugruk Road. And then it's about a mile off the, off the road. So here's what the channel, here it is. It's flowing from bottom to top. Here's what the channel looked like in 2006, 2011. These little red lines are dammed. So we see beavers move into the area. And 2014, 2015, 2017. And then in 2019, what happens is permafrost is heavily controlled by hydrology. So if you change the hydrology, you will change the permafrost. Um, and in this case, the beavers starts pushing water off into this ice rich tundra and it just falls apart. And it falls apart, it creates these new channels. And of course the beavers meanwhile are, are still there. They're putting up dams here, dams are overflowing, breaking over here and they're building new ones. And see, by 2021, you can see it's changed quite a bit. Let me show you what that looks like on the ground. Well, here, first I'll give you a cross section, right? So this is a cross section. The stream is flowing into, into the screen here. So it's flowing into the screen like that. The stream's flowing into the screen. And this, this green, this top line here, that's what the valley looked like in 2017. The beavers had already been there for a while, but they started to divert uh, divert the stream and what happened is it thawed permafrost all around the stream and it collapsed right so this is elevation on the, on the axis this is like you know this is a couple meters worth of elevation so six seven eight feet worth of elevation that the beavers divert the water permafrost the, that water thaws permafrost the, the, the water flows away it all collapses and so by the time that we showed up in 2021, we showed up to this, this 2020 line, you know? So, and this is happening on a scale, this is 200 meters wide. So it's just opened up this huge uh, valley. This is something that, so this is something that beavers of course do in ecosystems in lower 48 all the time, but when you have permafrost, it's actually exacerbating their effect on the landscape because of this tight relationship between hydrology and uh, permafrost. So here's what it looks like. Here's an oblique view. And this is a cross section. So here's 350 meters. This is the stream going this way, okay? And this whole thing over here is this entire area of permafrost that's collapsed as the stream has been, been diverted. So I'll, I'm just gonna skip this figure because I think, go ahead, did I, did I hear someone? That's all right. Oh, no, yeah. I finally yeah, go got in. I was having trouble. This is Orlan Bushu from the native village of Gamble. Sorry oh, for, right. for interrupting you. Oh, thanks Hi, for joining us. Yep. Hi, Orlan. We're glad you joined. Thank hey. you. Yep. Cool. Yeah, yeah. so here's, uh, you know, here's what it looks like adjacent to that stream. This is where the stream used to be. It just used to be this little kind of stream flowing right to left. And basically, the beaver gets in there and diverts the stream, and then the whole landscape just starts falling apart. And that's what you're seeing here. Super active, super recent permafrost thaw. And, and so there, this doesn't happen in every case. You have a, a, a beaver pond, but it happens quite a bit. This is not our only site like this. And so, so this is pretty exciting from a landscape change perspective, permafrost, 
a little bit frightening maybe because you know permafrost thaw is something that is already happening due to climate change but you mix beavers into the equation and it really speeds things up and that's really kind of our hypothesis our hypotheses are all around that you know we don't have all the answers but our predictions are based on the fact that beavers create a kind of oasis they create by pooling water on the landscape it absorbs more heat it thaws permafrost there's more open water unfrozen water in winter so both in the aquatic world and in the terrestrial world we see these beaver ponds as being oases for boreal species to to move into the arctic and get a foothold and if we were talking about a few dozen such oases it probably wouldn't it'd be sort of a novelty but really we're talking about tens of thousands of these um, and and so that's you have to sort of put that put all these little dots these little oases uh, all over the arctic landscape and then sort of try to imagine how that's gonna change what the future looks like in the arctic um this isn't too interesting but these are some papers that we've written and i put this here to emphasize this idea that you know we've started with the basic questions of where are they and when did they get there you know how many beaver ponds are we talking about where are they uh, where do they exist because they're not they weren't really considered an arctic species at all even though you all knew that they were because they've been out there for several decades but they weren't really considered an arctic species All right. Well, I don't know where Ken's gone off to, but maybe Fairbanks is having a little trouble. So we'll just be patient. Maybe he can crawl back on. I see there's comments in the chat. And uh, that's great. And as soon as he can claw back his, his way back on, I have no message from him. Um, we'll get to your questions. So. Stand by one. I'm going to try to give him a call. Hello. Hello. Oh, yeah, Orlin. Sorry about that. Um, the speaker has just dropped off the screen, so he's may have lost power. I just got a hold of his home base, and not his cell phone. So they have power at the house. So I'm going to try the university. Stand by. All right. All right, so I did get just get a hold of Ken and his battery died on his laptop. So he's a little bit uh, chagrined by that, has plugged it in. 
and is going to be joining us in a minute. And um, so stand by. All righty. Yeah. Orland, are you guys doing good with the stormy weather out there? Yeah, it's actually nice. It's sunny, uh, and there's some wind. There's a little bit of gust. Uh, rain and hail would come once in a while. Yeah, we've got sunshine, kind of these puffy clouds zipping by and blue sky right behind it. So we're all sort of not feeling too bad about things. The, oh, it's got some big waves, but nothing like we just had. So it seems very manageable. Yeah, you see me? Yeah, I do. I You're joining in. Too. Okay, cool. Oh, and there's Ken Tape. He's climbing back on. All oh, right. That was embarrassing. Can you That's enable, okay. can you enable That's okay. uh, screen sharing for me? Oh, yes. Oh, right. I need to. Amateur move. My That's battery okay. died. <laughs> That's all right. It was probably yelling at me, telling me uh, your battery's about to die, but I was too engaged in the task at hand, having too much fun. All right. So thanks for hanging with me. Sorry about that. Um, yeah, we started with questions of, you know, how many beavers are there? Where are they? We moved into in physical impacts, the hydrology and permafrost. And really where we're headed is looking at these questions about um, impacts to the carbon cycle, like methane emissions, um, impacts to biodiversity and fish and things like that. So that's uh, where we're headed maybe in the next several years. Let's see here. Oh, here's a pretty picture of uh, Salmon Lake. So yeah, I mentioned it, carbon cycling and methane, water quality. So, you know, temperature, dissolved oxygen, pH, basic things like that. Impacts the fish. That's a really complicated one if people have stories from their observations between uh, interactions between beavers and fish. You know, at, in temperate ecosystems, it's complicated the interaction between beavers and fish, but it's generally positive. And we don't know if that's gonna be the case in the Arctic or not. And it's, it's a difficult and very important question. Biodiversity, we're doing some eDNA, some DNA sampling to try to see how beaver ponds affect the biodiversity in these areas. Um, stream invertebrates. And then I mentioned these hypotheses all sort of surround this idea that they're creating an, an oasis. So why are they moving into the Arctic anyway? That's a difficult question. I mean, there's a couple big ones. Number one is rebound from overtrapping. That's been happening across North America, it's still happening in Asia. So that's, that's probably part of what we're seeing. I mean, beavers have come back to Fairbanks in the last hundred years too, but I'm, I'm not saying that that's climate change. It's just that they got heavily trapped for a couple hundred years and now they're rebounding. Um, but the other one, of course, is that their habitat has improved a lot in the Arctic. And beavers do not, um, they don't uh, hibernate, right? So they cache these shrubs and then swim out of their lodge and eat these shrubs all winter. And so you can imagine if winter is getting shorter on both ends, that that's a really big deal. It's just a shorter time to survive on shrubs without being able to really go up on the snow and, and, and harvest other, you know, more food, right? You're kind of limited to your cash that you go into winter with. And um, ask me about bank dens later if you're interested, beavers and bank dens, because I'm really talking about beaver engineering here, but there's also beavers and bank dens that don't have the same impact on the landscape, but they're interesting, particularly with this dispersal happening. And then of course, shrub expansion, there's tons more shrubs than there used to be. Uh, that's a big one. They eat shrubs. So yeah, like taller shrubs, it's going to be better habitat for them. And there's more unfrozen water in winter. And I think that's a really big one too. If a stream's frozen to the bottom, I think we, we encounter streams where there are beavers frozen, where the beavers are not frozen to the bottom. The ice is frozen to the bottom. And there are still beavers that seem to survive in those ponds. 
not necessarily in the pond, but upstream, it's, it's frozen to the bottom. So there's no extra water coming into the pond. Uh, but in general, they, they like these groundwater systems that have a little more groundwater, a little bit of discharge in the winter. But we don't really know the answer to this question fully. It's probably a combination of both of these things. And just to give you an example, this is not a great example, but this is, this is a pond that you'll see out the Kugaruk Road. I think it's mile 31. It's right when you come up to the saddle, right near the saddle before you drop sort of down in the Salmon Lake. On the right is this pond. So the road's actually going by sort of over here. Here's this pond. It's fairly new. I think it's less than 10 years old. And um, so here's what it looks like in the winter. And I'm sorry that I don't have the same view. That's the sat, the road's going by over here. Here's this little tiny stream that just starts right up there. It comes down and here's the beaver lodge in the middle of winter. And you know, you drill, we drilled into a pond, this pond and did not find uh, much unfrozen water. Having now gone back in the summer, I realized that there is a, there's a deep area over here where there was probably unfrozen, unfrozen water, but there's just not a lot of space down there. And, and even, even here, like there's just not a lot of shrubs. Well, this is, a, this is actually a pretty shrubby spot, but you know, this idea of what do they eat? And I mean, this guy is just, this family just totally frozen in there. And it just, I'm kind of marvel at the fact that they can survive these, these long winters. So I'd be curious if people see It'd be fun to see like what this looks like in the spring. Like they would kind of go out in the snow and like grab a shrub and run back. Cause I understand that their feet aren't really adapted to, to walk on snow, but if you're starving, I could imagine beavers kind of breaking out and um, you know, trying to, trying to get some forage. So that's what I have. Thanks for your attention. And um, yeah, I'd love to hear if you guys have observations or stories that you want to relate. I'd sure be curious to hear them. So thank you, uh, Ken. That was that was great. Plus the little surprise disappearing and coming back. We appreciate that. Yeah. You'd fit right in around here. <laughs> and and um, this is a time. I know we've got questions in the chat, which I'll I'll start off with. Um, and um, this is the time that the audience, while they're thinking of their questions, it's always nice to give the speaker. Let's give Ken Tape a little a little love for giving us information about beavers and the work he's doing here in the, in the Seward Peninsula. So Thank with that, guys. while Thank people you. are chatting away, we will go to the first question from David Payer, who says, can you also comment on the changes in shrub vegetation between these photos? It was, an, I think, an earlier photo with the mining ditch. Yeah, head. and let me let me. Can you hear me? Okay. Yeah, I can. Yeah. Hey, David. Hey, yeah. Hey, Ken. Uh, thanks. That was that was really interesting presentation. I've been following your work. I'm quite interested in this topic, and really cool. some great work here. Thank you. Um, and I was just I I thought that was an opportunity to maybe talk about, but I know that the imagery is different, and the one even before this, I think, uh, that had the infrared. Yeah, and we may not have the resolution to be able to comment on that, but but I just thought. That would be interesting because I know you've done a ton of work on on vegetation change. Um, so, yeah, I appreciate that. Um, usually, or often, I should say, I don't say usually, but often, the first part of this talk, I talk more about shrub expansion and show the repeat photography showing the expansion of, of shrubby vegetation. These days, I like to just drone on about beavers, so I kind of just left the the shrub stuff behind, but. Yeah, we have a lot of repeat photography and there's just been a lot of science showing that that shrubby vegetation is expanding its distribution and getting taller. There was even a paper about tree line uh, a couple months ago that was a pretty big deal in the Brooks range. This one unfortunately does not have the resolution, you know, there's probably tree line and a lot of shrub expansion going on here, I would guess. But I mean this also sort of underscores how dramatic the changes are that beavers induce. Now, granted, shrub expansion, because it's linked to climate, it's kind of happening everywhere. I mean, not quite everywhere, but it, it's widespread where beavers, you know, only affect the area that they, that they alter. Um, but like, notice that there's no resolution issue here with detecting the fact that beavers have moved into this, this picture. Um, but yeah, you know, if we had high resolution here, you know, you'd probably see some, uh, you'd probably see quite a bit of tree line expansion and shrub expansion 
you know, all, for example, all along the slope, like I see bare, like this looks like bare patches, right? These are probably bare patches and I'm just not seeing those, but it's a little hard with this color infrared stuff. It just lacks a little bit of, of resolution um, that some of this, I, I guess I'd probably use like some of that 50s black and white aerial photography might be a better comparison to this uh, 2019 image, but yeah, shrub expansion is a big deal, and it's definitely part of what's, you know, driving beavers in, into the Arctic. But to what extent, it's hard to say. It's a great question. Thanks, Dave. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Ken. All right. Thanks. And the next question is from Letty Hughes. Do we know approximately how many beavers may be equated to a dam? Looking at the beaver pond increase near Kotzebue. Can one beaver family increase the number of dams in that amount of time? Uh, I mean, one, one beaver family could not account for all those dams, but I don't really have an answer to that question. Um, another way to ask it is, is if you're counting lodges, right? Of course, we can't always see the, we often can't see the lodge. So I'll just show you what lodges look like because you can see them, but you can't see them well enough to like map them. Like this thing right here is probably a lodge right here, right? This thing right here might be a lodge. Uh, maybe this guy right here. But you can see it's, you know, it's kind of shaky. This one right here is probably a lodge. Um, that might be, you know, number of individuals per lodge. I think they've done some of that work, you know, in the lower 48. But I don't really know the numbers to answer your question. And you also have, of course, the bank dens. You know, the bank den beavers are kind of funny because they're kind of like, well, I don't know about this damn stuff. That looks like a lot of work. And all the good dam spots are taken. So I'm just going to, you know, put up shop here on the side of this river. Now, there's no engineering. So I kind of care about those beavers less. But just from a biological perspective, it's pretty interesting because those beavers, we work with Seth Kantner now quite a bit. And one thing that he's cued me into, and actually Keen Richards, a guy at the ADF and G was pointing this out as well. If you have a bank den and you have your cash out front and you get a flood event in August, the cash floats downstream often. And so Seth, it's pretty funny because Seth will send me these pictures. So he'll be driving up the Kobuk and he'll send me pictures of like a cash just floating down the Kobuk. From some high water. So for those bank denning beavers, I think that's just an interesting challenge that they have is that they have to be able to secure their, their food pile. I mean, if you lose your cash in August, where does that leave you? Um, but I can't really answer your question, Letty, uh, about, you know, yeah, what are, what are the number of beavers it takes to make that, that number of, of dams? And I think I was talking with Keen just today about, you know, doing some tagging some tagging of beavers would get at some of these questions of like, how far are these beavers going? Uh, you know, what's their range? And, and I think it's a lot of interesting questions would be interest, uh, answered with tagging, but I'm not the person for it, so. So the only thing I can answer that it, if a beaver, a bank denning beaver loses his cash in August, I would say he's going to be very busy. Yeah. Busy as a beaver. <laughs> <laughs> right. Probably. Get so to. I see Letty says they see many of these bank dens on the Kuzitrin River. Huh. Interesting. And and I have a question for for nomites in the area and and you as well. So uh, years ago, uh, I, I would fly a little bit more locally than I do currently now. And um, you could see where in those ditches, which you pointed out in the hills around Nome, um, those are still operational in that the beavers have gone up there and dammed them off. So they have sort of this long, skinny um, at yeah. altitude. Is there, any, um, is there anything you're looking at or can you see those or, or does anyone in Nome, if, are they still, is that still going on? But it was an interesting phenomenon to see that sort of beavers are going uphill and finding a place to live. And then the, the willows and whatnot are growing on and alders are growing because there's water up there. Right. Sort of a self. Are you, are you able to catch any of that with your satellite imagery? And is that? Um... I mean, I, see, I seem to recall mapping some of those, but among 10,000 ponds, 
I, I don't remember those specifically, but I think it's kind of cool okay. that they would choose such a perched water body as that, you know? I mean, that is, that's pretty ambitious. That wouldn't be my first choice of places to build a pond, but. View to die for, honestly. Probably What's that? Be. View to die for. No, that's there. a good point. That's a good yeah. point. I love, I love seeing the ones that are perched. There's one uh, going up the Kugrok Road on the, on the um, east side. It's like part way up the slope. You might have to be in a helicopter to see it. But these perched ponds are totally impressive from an engineering standpoint. So they're really hey, damning it all. Yes, indeed. Rick Tillman um, says apparently they really are damning it all. Yeah. 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 When is it going to stop? So here's a couple of questions for you. Yeah. One is when is this going to stop? When does it, when does this end? What does this look like in 30 years? You know? Um, and, and another question I have, and this is, I think, a complicated, difficult question, but when was the last time they were out here in these kinds of numbers? You know, beavers, beavers are at Shishmaref now. You know, they're all, all the way to the Bering Strait. When was the last time that they had beavers in Shishmaref? I mean, because it kind of gets at this question of what the drivers are. I mean, if it was just simply beavers reoccupying their former range that they had established prior to the fur, fur trapping industry coming in, then, um, you know, they would, if, if they were out there before, that would sort of answer that question. But I think that's a, just a really difficult question to answer. Were beavers out in these numbers on the Sewer Peninsula in, in the 1700s? So anyway, some, something to think about. Yeah, the paleo record. All That's right. Anyway. Rick Toman has his hand up, so um, let's go to Rick. Go ahead. Oh, and I see uh, we'll get to the chat in a minute. Sorry, chat people. Yeah, thanks very much. Um, great presentation, Ken. <clears throat> uh, I've great. seen you give this several times, and I learn something new every time. So thank you. Awesome. Awesome. Um, it, it did occur to me when you were showing the pictures there um, out the Cougar Rock Road, um, and just the tremendous amount of, of permafrost degradation in just a short time. It, it occurred to me as you were showing that, given the, that part of the Seward Peninsula's you know, extensive mining history in the early uh, 20th century, is there any reason to think that that permafrost is, is more susceptible to this, um, this kind of degrading than um, than someplace that didn't have that mining history would be? Hmm. I'm not sure. Um, you know, I had a, a guy come to a talk of mine in Fairbanks about six years ago, and he had done a bunch of mining out on the Seward Peninsula. And his sort of catchphrase was something that I, re that I distinctly recall was something like, every time you turn over a shovel, a beaver shows up. <laughs> You know, they, they go for the disturbances. And, and particularly with mining, you know, you got a bunch of tailings, now you got a bunch of willows, and there's generally a, a lack of permafrost once you, you know, mine. When, when I mapped the beaver ponds on the Sur Peninsula, I was struck by how many streams had been totally turned over, you know, over the last hundred years um, by mining. So I think, I think the mining tends to encourage beavers to to come into new areas just because it's a it's a good disturbance but i don't i don't necessarily see a strong connection with permafrost other than i i don't i don't know that beavers really i guess i can't answer the question <laughs> if, if beavers select for permafrost areas or not if i were a beaver i would not choose a stream like this one here it's got ice rich permafrost everywhere and is small and cold and frozen to the bottom and all that stuff. I'd go for the old mining, the stream that had all been all, you know, mined where everything's been turned over. It's all, uh, you know, water percolating through gravels and things like that. But so I, I don't think I gave you a very clear answer to your question. No, no, that's 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 great. Thanks. Um, okay. Just something I thought of as you were showing yeah. those um, really dramatic pictures. Thanks. Yeah, sure. Hey, Dean. Hey, Dean. How are you doing? First of all, nice talk. Really enjoyed it. 
cool. I'm Thanks, Dean. I'm going to try to give you a, another perspective maybe to look at. The water control people in California and Oregon have built all these dams. And now they're pulling their hair out saying, oh my gosh, we're getting these big blue green algae blooms behind the dam coming down, creating toxins, et cetera. A beaver dam can do the same thing. And if you talk to Alex Whiting up in Kotzebue, over the last 10, 15 years, they've seen this increase of blue green algae coming down mm. the no attack, coming down uh, the, uh, the Kobuk. Those are things you could possibly look at with your satellite imagery. I, I would urge you to look at those because those can have implications. I appreciate that comment. Um, there's a there's a social science component of our project where we're working in Shugnak, Kotzebue, and Noatak, and and Alex is actually the point point man in um, Kotzebue. So we will definitely ask him specifically about that. And I would generally agree that you know the effects are not uniformly positive in, in by any by any stretch. Right. Uh, you know, you talk about blue green algae, but I think another one is that beaver ponds can have really low dissolved oxygen content that kill like kill a lot of fish hanging out in beaver ponds. But I'm just I'm just kind of speculating based on on what I've heard. Um, Again, but yeah, great job. I, I enjoyed the talk. Really uh, I, I appreciate the comment. I'll I'll definitely definitely think about that. All right, you do have a question from Ramey. Bronstein, and that is how how has this affected the water levels in these rivers? Do we know? And Ramey, I don't know exactly which rivers um, where we were in the talk when you wrote that. I just, I guess, uh, do we? I think you, this that's part of your research. I I haven't uh, gotten that far, but sure. Um, okay. Any of the you know any of these creeks and rivers. And that's a good question, and I'm afraid I do not have the answer to that uh, yet. That's what I was thinking. Yet was the answer. I think yeah, yeah yet because I told you that we're supposed to be studying hydrology and permafrost, right. and that's definitely a hydrology question. Um, but no, we don't have an answer to it yet. We we just got a year's worth of data. We put these pressure transducers in the stream and in the pond, and what they do is they measure how high the water level is above the instrument. And so you can see the water level fluctuations. So we might be able to get at your question through some of that data. Right. And I'm sure that's going to change with you know how much snow is on the ground every year and, and sure. things like that. But you would definitely think that it would affect these water levels. Yes. Yes. I would think it would just kind of moderate the flood regime to right. some extent. But it's hard, it's hard to find control reaches. Right, like if you right. do the beaver affected area, the experimental finding the controls is hard. That turns out to be one of the more difficult things for us. That's a great question, though. Thanks. Thanks, Ken. All right, I don't see any questions. Oh man, right those were way. awesome questions. Thank you, everyone. I'm going to slip a question in myself. Okay, cool. And that is, um, are you for the? You know, you're you're asking about reoccupation. Have you gone through the state of Alaska's uh, fur sealing records for Region Five, which is the Seward Peninsula? So um, that might give you an indication of the number of beavers that were being utilized, and we're sort of in a in a you know an area. Sure, sure. Um, and then also, are you sort are you accessing that? at all yet yes mm -hmm. okay and then the other would be like the division of, of subsistence for fish and game if yeah they do household surveys right right and just probably to see. have some historical archived mm -hmm. information as well yeah that'd be interesting um but, one of my colleagues put together the fur bear sort of record um for several areas i'm not sure if he did this area or not but um it's kind of like you'd expect there was a decline in trapping in the first half of the 20th century, which coincided with, you know, 
beavers moving into a lot of these regions. So in that sense, yeah, I think it's a potentially a, a good resource. And then another question, probably my last, is are you familiar with the NG? So N-G-E-E -E is the yeah. acronym, the NG project. So yeah. Stan Walsh, uh, Walshliger. Yeah, yeah, right, Stan. I know right, right. so he's with the US Department of Energy and they're doing a really big study from Nome all the way to the, the oh. North Slope. And they're one of the things they're looking at is permafrost, permafrost degradation. And I didn't know if you were, and they're doing all kinds of modeling about the environment and things like that. Are you, I just saw him earlier today, he's in Nome and, and I thought, wow, you're talking about re-engineering and you're talking about these great slumps of permafrost because the beavers, are you guys hooked in together talking about permafrost loss? It just would seem like, wow, chocolate, peanut butter, boom. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Is it that good of a match? It um, might be. Yeah, you know, I've tried to uh, get some traction with the DOE folks to do this beaver work, uh, you know, just to sort of like pull this into their program. Um, but they haven't, they haven't bitten yet, you know. Um, they're aware of what we're doing. And of course, they have had a presence out in Nome for a lot longer than, than we have. They've been doing that work for, I don't, it seems like 10 years maybe 12. Um, but yeah, I, I, I think I'd like for beavers to be part of their program, but you know, it doesn't happen overnight and uh, it might not happen at all, but we'll see. Okay. You know, we'll see. Right. Yeah. Well, it just came because we hear of that. Yeah. We hear of them, their permafrost modeling. <clears throat> and then I just saw them today. So. Um, okay, cool. Cool. All right. All right. Any other questions about beavers? Very interesting. And I guess because a lot of the questions were unanswered and your work is still ongoing, did we get you back for, I'm sure you're going to be busy, yeah. but um, well, maybe we can get you back and you can tell us <coughs> the rest of the story as it, as it unfolds for, for you. Absolutely. So we're, I'll say my last piece, we're, we come out twice a year, once in late March and then once in August to, to do field work. And uh, you can always hit me up if you want to grab a cup of coffee and chat about beavers but uh but yeah we're, we love coming out there to do to to do field work it's an awesome area and good people and and we've got four more years on this project so we're Wonderful. looking forward to being able to answer a few more questions next time all right so thank you so much and for everyone in the audience um next week we have a two for two for double header so on tuesday we have um Brendan Kelly with the University of Alaska Fairbanks. He's going to be talking about his search project, which is uh, dealing with bringing together a collaborative effort of scientists and, and uh, policymakers, our coastal communities, and moving forward uh, with communications regarding science and maybe bringing in traditional knowledge and, and Western science. So it should be very interesting. That's on Tuesday night at 6.30, Tuesday, October 11th. And then Thursday, on October 13th, we have Nick Kinsman with the National Ocean Service, and her talk is going to be related to the storm we just had. She's going to be um, talking about a grassroots effort that was ongoing between multiple agencies dealing with our flooding situation, trying to get uh, good information for better forecasting. And she wants to talk about what happened during the storm, what happened during their grassroots effort, uh, collaborating with everybody that they could get a hold of and then how in the future we would be able to collect some data ourselves that might help us with getting post-disaster recovery funds, as well as helping the National Weather Service um, have better forecasting. So Tuesday night and Thursday night, it's gonna be a busy straight science week next week, but it should be very interesting. So thank you all for coming and thank you, Ken, once again. And um, actually, if you wanna stay on for a sec afterwards, yeah. Sure. That would be great. So thank you, everybody. Thank you, Orland, for calling all the way out from Gamble. We very much appreciate it and hope you guys are all safe and sound. And uh, have a good night, everybody. Okay.